So there is an intrinsic variability between the beats, between the electrical complexes. And, and that variability can be quantified. When somebody is doing very light exercise, their, their alpha one is around one or above. When they're in really high intensity zones, uh, maybe not max, but pretty high, it's about 0.5. When you get to be my age, you, you, you gotta really nail your recovery properly because you can get tired and overtrained very, very easily. Mm -hmm. So knowing what, where your zone one is, is, is critical. What do you measure as the first threshold? Is it a log-log plot, logarithmic versus logarithmic? Is it one millimole rise? Is it half millimole rise? Is it a two millimole exact, you know, plateau? If you're well hydrated, all right, and it's not that hot out, um, why is your heart rate getting higher? And a lot of that is, is the underlying uh, autonomic nervous system stress response. Welcome to this new episode. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor for the podcast, Moxie Monitor. If you've been following my work, you know that the Moxie is a tool that I use a lot for testing, but also for everyday training and coaching. For those who don't know about the Moxie Monitor yet, it's a NIRS device that measures muscle oxygen saturation and blood volume in real time. It's a non-invasive sensor that is placed on the skin and can be worn during any training or sporting activity. Motocross riders and climbers wear it on their forearms, hockey players on the ice, swimmers can wear it in water, I've used it to test rugby players, CrossFit athletes, endurance athletes, and more. The Moxie allows you to individualize work and rest periods, optimize load, reps and sets, identify training thresholds in real time, and even correct movement based on what the data shows you. You can also use the Moxie monitor to determine an athlete's energetic limiting factor and their individual training zones. Using this process, I can now target the athlete's limiter with precision in order to improve their performance without adding unnecessary volume to their program. You can view and collect the data on your Garmin watch and can also pair the Moxie with other physiological testing products such as the VO2 Master, Pinoe, and Cosmet VO2 systems. The Moxie is a product I've been using for many months with great success and I highly recommend it to any coach who's interested in digging a little bit deeper on the physiological side of health, fitness, or performance. You can use the coupon UPSIDE at checkout for a 5% discount on moxiemonitor.com shop. That's UPSIDE, U-P-S-I-D-E for a 5% discount. With that said, let's get into the show. Okay, Bruce, we are live on the podcast. How are you doing? I am good today. Thank it's you. It's really great to, to have you on. Uh, to give a little bit of context to the conversation, I found your blog about a month and a half ago. And I literally just looked through the topics and I said, oh my God, this is what I'm doing for the next four days. And I proceeded to read most of your articles. I didn't read all of them, but all the one on muscle oxygen uh, that you wrote, I read. And then uh, I started discovering all things heart rate variability with you. Uh, heart rate variability has, has been around for a while. When, it, when, it, uh, when we talk about um, quantifying or uh, figuring out the readiness of an athlete for their day and all those things. But I'd never seen HRV being used in dynamic exercise. And so that was kind of a, a big new thing for me uh, reading your blog. But before we go too far into the weeds, um, why don't you take a, a minute to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a uh, older guy uh, who kind of got it. How old are you, Bruce? I'm 65. And I kind of got into this through the back door. I, um, I'm a physician, double mm -hmm. board certified endocrinology and internal medicine, and a very busy private practice, and, um, which I left four years ago. But I, 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 yeah, I'm a teacher, and I teach residency programs here. Um, but anyway, I, I was always into sports and um, did a lot of strength training. So I was doing strength training and basically destroying my shoulder on heavy weights. So I had to back off the weights. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had to read all the literature. And I don't if, if you've heard of something called katsu. It's uh, very yeah. big in Japan. BFR, where they yeah. put bands uh, on the muscle to yeah. decrease blood supply. So you can lift very low loads mm -hmm. under ischemia. And I had this brilliant idea. I said, wow, I'm going to get a muscle oxygen sensor. And I'm kind of optimizing. I can't, I'm not going to do bands because you can't put a band on your chest. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to put the sensor, you know, in various locations. And I'm going to go up on the weight till I get kind of an optimal 
low weight, but good hypoxia. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into the muscle O2 sensors. And I also did cycling. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I got the sensor now. Why don't I go out, and, you know, ride, ride it with, you know, ride my bike and see how the sensor does. Mm -hmm. And that's how I kind of got into the blog because, and I know your Moxie sponsors you, but um, you have to remember my background. I'm a stickler for science. Yeah. You know, and, and not only science, in my day and age, being a physician, we were taught not to trust anybody. So if we read a paper, it was like assumed to be erroneous until proven otherwise. So, you know, I, I would read these blog posts on the Moxie forum and I'd say, wait a sec, you know, this doesn't necessarily make sense or where's the proof? So I said, I'm going to make my own blog about this. And that's why my blog says, is, is muscleoxygentraining.com. It has nothing to do with heart rate variability. <laughs> so yeah, I did that for a couple of years and it wasn't a great blog because I was like, full, you know, balls to the walls, practicing, mm -hmm. seeing 30, 40 patients a day, very busy office. And um, yeah, a, a couple of few years ago, um, I got a new Garmin watch. And one of the uh, claims of the Garmin watch was it would use heart rate variability somehow to calculate your VO2 max better. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, that doesn't make much sense to me. As you said, heart rate mm -hmm. variability during dynamic exercise it's really hard to do. And I started looking at all the indexes because I had done a bunch of ramps. And the only index that really made sense as your exercise intensity was going up was the DFA alpha one. Can you, can you explain? I'd like to go into, uh, I'd like to go into a little bit of detail on this. Uh, it's a, it's quite a technical topic. Um, I've watched a, a, a few videos on the topic and I'm going to be completely honest. I haven't grasped all the, the details of it, but I find it really, really interesting. So from, from your understanding of it, could you explain, uh, to the best of your ability, I guess, uh, what DFA alpha one represents maybe uh, actually, before we go into that, uh, starting at baseline, what is heart rate variability? And then, right. and then go into the DFA alpha one metric, right? A heart rate variability is simply variability in the, in the, a uh, distance between each beat in time. So uh, let's say your heart rate is 60 beats per minute. Turns out you're not beating every one second. You know, it's 0.9 seconds, 1.1 seconds, and everything in between. So there is an intrinsic variability between the beats, between the electrical complexes. And, and that variability can be quantified. One of the simplest ways of, of looking at this is something called, it's, it's, an, it's a common index, the SDNN, which is just standard deviation of a bunch of uh, intervals. Mm -hmm. So between each beat, you have a time. So it's 1,000 milliseconds or 950 milliseconds, what have you. So you line up all these figures in Excel and you, you, you know, run a standard deviation on, on that. Mm -hmm. And, and, that's, you know, one metric of heart rate variability. There are others. There are a whole bunch. Yeah, that's the, that's the one thing that I discovered through your blog is that you hear heart rate variability and then you have those apps that help you measure it in the morning and then you have a score. But if once you start looking into it, do you, how many metrics of heart rate variability is there? There are many, many, <laughs> many, many. But what I want to say is where DFA Alpha Okay, uh, detrended fluctuation analysis, that's what the DFA stands for, uh, comes into play. It looks for patterns, it looks for correlation, and it looks for complexity. Mm -hmm. And that's where it deviates uh, substantially from some of those other, what we call linear indexes, where it's a standard deviation or a root mean square, which is again, another mathematical calculation of a bunch of numbers. With, with uh, uh, alpha one, uh, we're looking at patterns, correlation. So let's say one of the, the um, uh, analogies is that of a random walk. So here you are, all right? And you could, you're, you're the random walker and you could go left or right, take a step forward, either go left or right. So you take a series of left and rights and based on that pattern, your next step is part of that 
pattern again. So uh, it, if there's no pattern, if it's random, the DFA alpha one is 0.5. OK, if there is a pattern, let's say you went right, right, left, right, right, left. I'm just making something very simple mm -hmm. that would be correlated. That's a correlated pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a pattern that instead of deviates away from the midline, it goes back to midline. That's anti correlated. That's below 0.5. So we have these different correlation patterns which are somewhat similar to fractals in a way. Fractals mm -hmm. are like these uh, self-similar repeat patterns that are the same depending on the scale you want to look at. So you look at a coastline uh, zoomed in, it looks kind of the same as zoomed out mm -hmm. or a broccoli or tree branching. You get the idea. And, and there are fractal patterns. There are correlation patterns in the heart rate as well which is totally different than the, you know, root mean square or the standard deviation. Again, we're looking at patterns. And where, where this comes into play is there's a much larger dynamic range of these patterns during exercise than we have with everything else. Mm -hmm. With all the other heart rate variabilities, the, the conventional stuff, past the aerobic threshold, they're all flat, they're all in nadir. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if you look back 20 years, there are indexes, there are studies using uh, SDNN, the SD1, which is another uh, index, and they, they, they do an exercise ramp, and they watch the variability go down. And at the point where it doesn't go down any further, that's, that's the aerobic threshold. So if you keep looking at the index, it's worthless, mm -hmm. because it can't go down any lower. So you have a very restricted range of where that type of uh, index is going to help you. The other thing is you need units of measurement for that index. You need it calibrated to a ramp. Mm -hmm. With DFA alpha, it's dimensionless. So a 0.75, let's say for you, is going to be the same intensity, relative intensity for me at 0.75. Mm -hmm. So again, it has a lot of advantages. Um, so yeah, I was looking at all these indexes myself as kind of a, you know, just, I, I don't believe this stuff is going to work. And lo and behold, the DFA alpha, at least for me, it worked. And I got a, a, in touch with Thomas Grunwald in Germany, who's done a lot of work with this. And we started working together to see if we can actually line up a value mm -hmm. with thresholds, with, with physiologic thresholds, like the first ventilatory threshold. Um, what does DFA alpha one represent? What does this, uh, unique, uh, like you said, correlation metric, nonlinear correlated correlation metric of heart rate variability, what does it represent? What does it tell us when you see the, the those numbers pop up, uh, whether it's on your app or if you run that through a software like Runalyze or Kubios, I know you've been talking about Kubios a lot. Um, so what does it actually tell us? What does it represent? It tells us how like a complex fractal pattern or a repeating pattern we have. Mm -hmm. If it's well correlated, if it's fractal-like, um, that's a value of around one. Again, the 0.5 is random. There's, there's mm -hmm. no pattern. Mm -hmm. It's just a bunch of numbers that, that do, do not re uh, replay themselves on repeat. And again, below 0.5 is the anti-correlated. There is a pattern, but it brings us back to kind of this midline. Mm -hmm. So we have different kind of uh, zones, um, which is kind of physiologic zones based on values. Which right. is so you, you, sorry to cut you off. So you, we have those, like you said, those different values that you've been able to associate to different, I guess, intensity domains and then thre physiological thresholds. But um, maybe if we take it more broadly, HRV in general, what does it represent from, from a from an organism's perspective? What does it tell us? What's going on? Is it is it uh, something that's let's say centered on the heart? Is it something about the nervous system? Yeah, um, it, it, it's basically there's something called the autonomic nervous system, which is the parasympathetic and the sympathetic branches. These mm -hmm. are involuntary systems. It's not like the nervous system where you move your arm. That's voluntary. This is involuntary. And 
it's under both hormonal control and neurologic control through the vagus nerve. And there are these pacemaker cells in the heart that initiate the cardiac beats and the, the uh, neurologic inputs from the vagus nerve uh, affect those pacemaker cells to make the beat pattern different. So as we do more exercise, the parasympathetic withdraws and the sympathetic, the fight or flight enhances. So we're basically getting a uh, view of autonomic balance okay. when we look at DFA alpha one. Mm -hmm. And so you've been able to uh, pinpoint those, I guess, two values, 0.75 and 0.5 in the DFA alpha one index. Uh, so what do those values represent? Or what, what have you been able to uh, interpret them as so far? Well, um, yeah, empirically, if you look at old studies, when, when somebody's doing very light exercise, their, their alpha one is around one or above. When they're in really high intensity zones, uh, maybe not max, but pretty high, it's about 0.5. So our idea was to look at kind of in the middle for where the aerobic threshold would be, and that's 0.75. And lo and behold, it's, that's where the aerobic threshold turned out to be, 0.75. I mean, there is going to be, in anything, some variability in, in individual response. So you may be at 0.7, or your friend may be at 0.8. And if you look at some of our studies, you know, that the points are not exactly on a flat line. Uh, that is the same way if you look at um, even gas exchange, the, mm -hmm. the you know, fancy mask things. Uh, I, I don't know if you realize this, but up to 20% of those tests are not interpretable. Mm -hmm. You cannot find a ventilatory threshold. You can't find that, that first aerobic threshold. Yeah, you could find a VO2 max. That's easy to do. Right, but but the nuances there, you know, it, it, it's not an exact science. Lactate is not an exact science. So yeah, we think around 0.75 is the realm of the aerobic threshold, and the and the 0.5, the point where you go from uh, correlated to uncorrelated random to anti-correlated, getting back to midline, that seems to be a point of unsustainability. Mm -hmm. Unsustainable is the maximal lactate steady state. Yeah, oh, I guess, it, yeah, depending on the model that you want to apply to it, we've got the maximum lactate steady state. We've got more recently the critical power right. uh, model that's been applied as well. That seems to be uh, the best way I've, I've heard it described. I, I forget if it was Andy Jones, uh, maybe it was Mark. Uh, I, believe, I believe MLSS was the top of the heavy intensity domain, the, the, the top end, the ceiling, and then critical power being the, 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 the ground floor, the bottom of the severe intensity domain. Uh, I guess it, it allows us to put, well, they're, they're two different concepts and not the, the same thing. Uh, so they're hard to put on a continuum, but I, I mean, I find um, to go on a little tangent, I find it to be the same with all the other thresholds that we have. Uh, I mean, we've been talking here about heart rate variability threshold and that 0.75 being associated with that first threshold, whether it's, uh, you know, first lactate threshold, first ventilatory threshold, gas exchange threshold, there's many names that we assign to them. And I guess, depending on which system you're measuring and analyzing, uh, you might come out with either a value that's a little bit different, uh, or you might just, uh, you know, not, like you said, not get it at all, depending on, on what you're looking at. Um, why why do you think those thresholds are are important in the first place? Why do do we need to figure out how to zero in on uh, on those transition points from domain to domain? In your opinion, well, as you know, that um, in, with with endurance exercise training, uh, we have these models. We have pyramidal threshold, polarized. Uh, I'm a big fan of polarized myself. And uh, w w again, with all these models, most of them want you in that kind of easy zone one um, uh, area below the aerobic threshold, below VT1 or LT1 uh, for most of your training, all right? Because if you do a lot of high intensity work or you do a lot of kind of zone two, which, uh, or zone, uh, you know, it depends. I, I'm a three zone model guy. So, you know, between the aerobic and the anaerobic threshold, you do a lot of work in there, you're too tired 
to really do any quality work anymore. Uh, this becomes even more important as you get older. So a lot of your listeners are, you know, young and, and strong and, you know, when you get to be my age, you, you got to really nail your recovery properly because you can get tired and overtrained very, very easily. Mm -hmm. So knowing what, where your zone one is, is, is critical. Um, you know, knowing where your zone two to three transition is, your anaerobic, in my opinion, except for kind of testing purposes, it's not that essential because you could tell someone, go out and do a three minute max or do a five minute max. By definition, they have to be in zone three there. Mm. All right. Because, you know, FTP is a 20 minute max. Um, and, you know, plus or minus the FTP is, is about the anaerobic threshold plus minus. So again, anything below that 20 minute mark near max is going to get you zone three. Mm. But zone one, that's tough. You know, people talk about the talk test. Uh, hell, I, I get winded, you know, walking across the street. That doesn't work for me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, knowing where your zone one is with a very simple heart rate variability test that pretty much anyone can do is, 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 is money in the bank, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, I find it. And that's, that's really one of the, the main draws that I had to, to your approach or to that approach that you've described at length on your blog. And then you, you've published some, some papers recently as well on the, on the topic. And it seems like if there is that way of figuring out somebody's threshold, at least, the, like you said, that first threshold that is uh, of vital importance when it comes to being able to accumulate uh, productive volume without having the drawback of uh, nervous fatigue accumulation, I guess that would be one of the ways to put it. Um, and you could do that just with a heart rate strap and, and a, a specific app that allows you to, to get those RR values precisely. Um, that is quite the, the step forward in terms of quote unquote zoning compared to having to go for a lab. I mean, those, those are the kind of tests that, that I do and I provide for athletes, but I mean, if I can work from someone, um, you know, from a distance even and say, Hey, strap that, put that heart rate strap on. This is the app that you're going to use to record your, your session. Here are the, the intervals I want you to do uh, progressively a, a nice little ramp uh, so that we can actually see those transition points and then use that value to estimate that first threshold. It's extremely interesting from a practical standpoint, because it, it literally gives access to it to, to everybody where before you had to book a test, you had to go into a lab, you had to do get all, all those extra tools um, to work with. That being said, again, I've, I've, I've been applying the HRVT um, more in, in the recent weeks. And uh, it's interesting because on some individuals, it maps perfectly with the other transition points that I can find uh, from a respiratory standpoint. I don't have lactate yet, but that's coming. Uh, so the respiratory stuff, um, I also use the good old RPE because it's always good to know how hard somebody feels like they're going. Um, and again, that H HRVT for some people, it maps, maps perfectly onto their first threshold uh, if we look at the other systems, but for others, it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, align with it. Do, do you think that if we maybe take the, the conversation one step back, do you think that different systems can have different thresholds? Because we have the nervous system, we have the respiratory system, we have the cardiovascular system, we have the, you know, the muscular system, all those things work together. And we know the, the chain, if we talk, you know, FIC equation, VO2 max, and the, and the chain of events that happen when we start exercising and sustain a certain intensity of, of output. But do all those different interacting systems have to necessarily have one uh, exact and matching transition point between those different states, in your opinion, or do you think there might be actually some some differences depending on the person and depending on the context? I, I that's a really good question, and I'll I'll answer it. Uh, it's kind of a two part answer. I think um, underlying in a perfect world the transitions for gas, lactate, and and autonomic. Uh, heart rate variability would would be the same, mm -hmm. but uh, let's let, I'll talk about myself for a sec. So I went to the University of Florida, and they got a very high end sports center, and did a you know VO two max ramp test um, and lactate simultaneous, and my VT my VT one was one hundred and seventy watts. Mm -hmm. My LT one was two hundred and five watts. Mm -hmm. Now you know that's huge. Um, 
Now, when they when they uh, uh, did the gas exchange, they they used the computer software mm-hmm. to analyze it, and that's what a lot of centers do. You know, they have this sophisticated computer software. It, you do the test, it spits out your number. Well, we know that this computer software, because studies have been done, is very flawed. And and I, again, when I first got those results, I said, oh, you know, the, 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 there's something wrong with the lactate. I don't think there was anything wrong with the lactate because my heart rate variability threshold is exactly what the lactate was. I think the machine just goofed the VT1. And again, it, even lactate, if how do you measure, what do you measure as the first threshold? Is it a log log plot, logarithmic versus logarithmic? Is it one millimole rise? Is it half millimole rise? Is it a two millimole exact, you know, plateau? I mean, there are different options. And, and part of our review article we did in Frontiers a year ago uh, was to basically not poke holes, but just say, you know, which option do you want to take? You're going to get different results. Um, so again, it's at the measurement uh, angle that may make the difference between all three. Now, one of the, uh, the criticisms, um, we, we, get, we have some haters out there for the alpha one. And one of the criticisms is, oh, you know, I did this uh, ramp and I got a value of 200 watts and I did it again, I got 150. Uh, you know, your, your, your index is, is garbage. Well, uh, there, there is a, 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 a mitigating factor here and that's fatigue and other things. Mm. So yes, if you did a ramp the day after you went out there and did a hundred mile, um, you know, really hard ride with all your buddies, you know, trying to, you know, kill each other, your ramp is going to show very different thresholds mm-hmm. than if you had several days of rest beforehand and a taper. Um, now that is a problem on one hand, but it's also a feature on another. And we, we, we um, published a few months ago a very uh, interesting study looking at ultramarathon uh, effects on the Alpha One. Mm-hmm. So we had, I don't know if, you, if you're familiar with that article. Um, it's, it's on my blog as far as a, a couple of descriptions. Uh, basically, uh, got some guys to do a very slow jog on a treadmill. All right. Alpha Ones were nice and high, as expected. They went out for a six hour trail run, okay? And came back and jumped right on that treadmill again, same speed. Mm -hmm. And their alpha one was really low. It plummeted Mm -hmm. uh, to the levels below 0.5, the Mm anti-correlated that we only see in those really, really severe exercise domains. So what that tells us is we can use the index for fatigue. We match that up to a counter movement jump, uh, measurement and the counter movement jump looks at uh, neuromuscular fatigue and it, it, it showed that, that these guys were shot after a six hour trail run. So yes, we can if we see a deviation in alpha one behavior, we can interpret that as the autonomic nervous system is perceiving a, a, an aberrancy, an abnormality, a fatigue, an illness. I mean, so what, what there, there are features of this that can be extremely useful for someone who's training. So they get on their bike or they start running and they're going easy in the warm up, and they say, wow, you know, my alpha one is, is really low now. Um, why is that? And sure, it could be a few artifacts, but if it stays low, it's, it's a red flag that they perhaps should back off. They're either brewing a virus, they're overtrained, overreached, something fishy is going on. Mm-hmm. I guess what what you're saying here makes a lot of sense from you know like i guess you could we could extend that to almost any internal physiological uh, measure that we would take those are going to be influenced by by the status of the organism itself and like you said fatigue is a big parameter we have heat we have hydration we have you know glycogen store status um i mean and that's been that's been shown as well i, I don't know about the i don't know if those studies have been done on on the lactate threshold itself but i know that um, Andrew Jones did a lot of work on critical power and how it is affected by fatigue. And it is a dynamic quote unquote threshold in the sense that the thre- the physiological thresholds that, like you said, we measure in a ramp test or, or any other situation, they're not fixed values. They're not absolutes. They're right. relative transition points in the way that our body, I guess, functions overall. And, and those 
the inflection points do evolve as the status of the organism himself, itself changes, like you described right. right now. Right. One thing I do want to uh, say as far as distinct, uh, a distinction between kind of using our index as a fatigue training modality rather than something else, mm -hmm. it can be done in a warm up and it could be done at a very low intensity. So you don't have to go out and do a three minute max critical power test, which, you know, I, I've never done in my life and I have no intention of doing, but I don't know if I'd survive it. <laughs> I'm um, still debating whether I should try this all out three minute or not. I, I, yeah, I did, yeah. uh, I, I found um, there's some uh, a little aside on that topic. I don't know if you've seen some interesting papers from uh, Mehdi Cordy, and he's been looking at uh, two parameter critical power um, you know, calculations with a three and a 12 minute effort. And if you're familiar enough with those efforts, you get to values that are very close to using three different efforts, which starts to become interesting because definitely when you start talking about doing five or seven tests to, to task failure, you're, it's, not, it's not a very uh, a joyful thought to say, okay, what are you doing for the next 10 days? I'm burying myself into the ground just to get my critical power and my W prime. So I, I agree that it's super interesting as well for, like you said, uh, to have something that enables you to see and 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 it's I guess it's an it's an applied measure versus the HRV at rest that is also very valuable, but it doesn't tell you how your body's functioning once you sit on the on on the bike, right? Right, right. And and heart rate variability at rest has a huge fan base, and and fair amount of literature. Mm -hmm. um, not all the literature shows that it's helpful. By the way, there have mm -hmm. been a few critical reviews. Uh, meta-analysis over the last couple of months. Um, but one of the problems I have with resting um, is I don't have the time in the morning to like, you know, get a few minutes of like, okay, sit quietly, you know, breathe, uh, you know, no distractions. I mean, I got dogs to walk. I got an office to get to. I mean, it just, it's not going to happen. So, so, you know, um, with, with, with our index, you know, not our index, but with the A1 index, uh, we, we, you can just get out on your bike or you start running and, you know, in the warm up, again, you don't have to go above the warm up. You'll get an idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to go a little more than warm up, that's fine too, but you don't need to do like, okay, I need to, to do a critical power test to figure this out. Where I, you know, need to see if I can, you know, still do three minute max at my three minute max power. You don't have to do any of that. So, uh, yeah, we're looking at it as a, a an index of readiness, as an index of durability. Mm. Um, you know, as far as uh, over time, does this thing, uh, be, the behavior change? Uh, for instance, uh, my my alpha one is is correlated. It's above one in my zone one. And then I do a whole bunch of high intensity efforts. And then I look at it again in that same zone one, it's like it's low. My durability isn't that good. And I've noticed over the last few years, you know, I'm in the age now where you, you start to take a dive. And, you know, I, again, despite all the training, um, it's like in a microcosm, I'm, I'm kind of watching this happen. My durability is not what it was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can still do the same metrics, the same three minute max, the same wind gate power. Uh, you know, all those are about the same, but again, the durability is not as good. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of um, alternate utilities to the autonomic measures in conjunction with the external load measures. Mm -hmm. So in a vacuum, alpha one can tell us um, your approximate uh, perceived zone. All right, where the alpha one is, it's about your intensity zone. But if we then couple that with power or pace, we have something that can give you us an index of fatigue and durability. Uh, if we're if we're you know harboring an, an illness or you know we're pre-viral or something or other. Mm -hmm. um, so again, a lot of other things we can we can learn. Yeah, um, I definitely want to come back to those um, other applications of the DA, uh, DFA alpha one. Uh, metric. I wanted to come back to our discussion on thresholds. Um, I had a I had a thought. You said in an in an ideal world, right. all those transition points are very close together. Would uh, Would you say that for somebody who's maybe untrained on a given modality, that 
that may uh, that person may display very different thresholds depending on what system we're assessing and maybe let me uh, detail my thought for a second here i'm thinking about you know somebody who maybe is a, a fit individual but doesn't have much exposure to the bike for example to take a very simple modality we know that um, we know that familiarity with the modality has an influence on the quality of the tests that we can run uh, and, and then the, the, validity, the validity of the results that we're going to get out of a test. So for example, if I take a rugby player who runs a lot and he's fit, but he never cycles really. So his endurance and his, uh, I guess, uh, muscle coordination and uh, motor pattern of firing is going to be different on a bike than it is running. And if he's not acquainted with the bike, would you say that it's possible that uh, for example, is DFA Alpha 1 a uh, threshold of 0.75, which should be corresponding to his first, uh, whether it's lactate, ventilatory, or other threshold, um, that one might be high. Why? Because he's a fit individual and his nervous system can tolerate a good amount of work before it transitions in, from one state to another, uh, whereas maybe his respiratory system or his muscular system is not at the same level of uh, maybe fitness as this, as let's say, let's take his autonomic nervous system as an example here with the DFL alpha one. And so in, in a case like that with someone who maybe is not trained for the modality or maybe untrained, we might see a decoupling of, of, those, different, uh, of those different thresholds that we might be able to observe, which in my mind, again, just makes sense from the standpoint of the transition has to start somewhere. I, I, in my mind, it doesn't make as much sense to think that all those systems are going to just switch from you know one state to another. If we think lactate threshold one, if we take ventilatory threshold one, and any other breakpoints that we can find in in the physiological realm, why would all of them just at, at some precise point in time switch from one state to another? Versus, oh, you know what? Actually, the 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 let's say the respiratory system starting to give a little bit, and now there's a cascade, let's call it, of thresholds going down the line. And then again, like you said, ideally they're pretty tightly coupled and they work uh, close together or they happen close in time together. But do you think there is a place uh, for de decoupled thresholds if, if that's even a, a term that, that warrants using? That, that's a really good question. And I, I don't think so. Um, and let, me, let me explain. Mm -hmm. um, the underlying biochemistry um, again, it's, we don't have time and, and it's maybe we have a, a little, little bit of time. And if you want to go into some detail, you're more than welcome to. The, the underlying biochemistry with lactate and carbon dioxide and oxygen fluxes um, is going to be the same. Mm -hmm. So again, um, there have been studies and, and some really nice papers written um, that these points should correlate they should be the same. They may not be measured the same as I discussed before mm -hmm. because of the way, that's our fault. But the underlying physical chemistry is, is there. Now, the autonomic nervous system perceives all these different things. It's like a central governor, yeah. we call it organis organismic demand. Um, it's kind of looking at everything. And uh, it's still looking at these fluxes. So it should still correspond. Now to answer another, the practical part, we, we published another study looking at patients with heart failure and coronary disease mm -hmm. and looking to see if the 0.75 was valid for those guys. Mm -hmm. And it was. So we looked at their first ventilatory threshold. We matched it up with heart rate variability, the alpha one, and we had very good correlation. Mm -hmm. with the first ventilatory threshold. Mm -hmm. So they had poor muscle mass, poor contractile function. But again, when the, the oxygen and, and CO2 fluxes shift to the ventilatory threshold one, when lactic acid shifts, again, part of that mm -hmm. um, th th ventilatory threshold is carbon dioxide and lactic acid. Um, again, it, it, it corresponds to autonomic changes mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, getting back to your soccer player, um, yeah, the soccer player does not have the efficiency on the bike that the cyclist who spends seven hours a day pedaling in circles has, or the cyclist who, again, is a great on a bike, but has really poor running efficiency because mm -hmm. he doesn't run. I mean, mm -hmm. not coordinated, poor stride, 
klutzy. Uh, so again, you have to look at efficiency factors. You have to look at muscle specificity. Mm -hmm. So even though biking and running look the same, the muscle specificity is much, much different. Mm -hmm. One's concentric, eccentric, one's basically all concentric. Um, so again, there are other reasons. I don't think it's the underlying physiology. Mm -hmm. uh, these, these tests are still valid um, as far as that goes. Okay. I, I appreciate you going into a bit more detail on that. Um, maybe to touch on a, a very practical uh, aspect of what we've been talking about. Can you take, tell us a little bit about heart rate sensors and the ones that are available to the public, the ones that are popular, and in your opinion, which one or which ones people should gravitate towards if they want to ensure uh, the best measures, just, I guess, basically for heart rate to begin with. And then now that we've been talking about a heart rate variability in dynamic exercise, it's a completely different uh, beast. And actually, maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, why is it so much, why does the precision of the heart rate sensor become so much more important once we start talking about heart rate variability versus just measuring uh, your heart rates uh, during exercise? That, that is one of my favorite questions. And it's a fascinating uh, answer. You're, you're welcome. Um, Let's go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. First, we need a lot of precision in measuring the beat the beat change. Remember, we're looking for patterns. All right. Uh, and the exact timing uh, is, is, is key here. It's almost like you have a camera lens and you smear some oily goo on the front and you wonder why your, your picture isn't that crisp. It's the same thing. If you don't have really accurate um, measurements of those R to R peaks, all right, um, you will not see the patterns. You can get other indexes. And we've at, we're actually, we're doing a validation study for the move sense uh, ECG unit, which mm -hmm. uh, Sunto, which just spun off Move Sense as a separate company, um, asked us to uh, to evaluate this thing as far as uh, accuracy of heart rate variability. And the RR, uh, I, I've just been analyzing this stuff over the last week. So the RR measurements are like spot on with an ECG. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at all the different heart rate variability, variability indexes, alpha one I'm not saying one is better than the other, but they're, they're not as close as you would think they should be given how similar the mm -hmm. RR or the heart rate is. Mm -hmm. And again, we're looking at patterns and these patterns can even be different depending on where on the chest you put the measurement. So if you, uh, and studies have been done about this, depending on which leads on an ECG you use, you can get different measurements for heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I think I even made a post on this, very, very interesting stuff. So when you say, well, you know, um, my sensor is better than your sensor, it, it may be the strap is just different. Mm -hmm. or where where your, your heart is positioned in your chest is a little bit different than you or I. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you get the practicalities here, uh, I personally have had very good results with the Polar H10. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's great. It's precise. You even can get a, a, an ECG lead out of it. Really? Um, yeah, there's an app called Fatmaxer, which I've, I've put on my blog a bunch of times, mm -hmm. um, that I did not write, but I had some input into it, and the developer's a great guy. And I basically poured my heart out to this fellow. And I said, could you do this? Could you do that? Oh, and could you add this and that? And he did it. And I mean, it is like the app that I would create if I had to create an app. Is it available uh, on both Android and iOS or? Android only. Android only. Okay. Android only. But it basically does everything Kubios Premium does mm -hmm. on a mobile phone. Which, for those who don't know, is a, is a fairly expensive uh, desktop software to analyze heart rate variability, correct? Correct. And it does it in live view, right. I mean, on the spot as you're, as you're doing your thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it, it brought a totally new dimension to, to real-time tracking. Um, heart rate variability logger from um, Marco Altini was the first one out. And, mm -hmm. and 
when there was nothing else available, it, you know, it, it was the only the app to do. But it has some drawbacks um, as far as accuracy, as far as it gives you a two minute window. Yeah. But nothing in between. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of our big advantages, or I should say advances in tracking what we have to do a two minute window, we have to look at two minutes worth of beats. Mm -hmm. But if we do so every five or 10 seconds, we get boom, 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 we get points, a lot mm -hmm. of points. So we don't have to wait two minutes to get our next point. We wait five seconds and we get the next two minute window. So this kind of rolling sequential windowing mm -hmm. was a big advance and allowed us to actually do the threshold measurement. Because if you do, let's say, a nine-stage ramp, you only have nine values if you're doing short stages. Mm -hmm. Not many values to plot a curve with. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're doing a, a value every five seconds, all of a sudden you see this nice kind of linear drop right through the area where we want to plot. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, using a fat maxer, we not only get the alpha one very accurately, but we get it every five seconds. And it also does a snippet. If it, if it detects any artifact, it spits out and saves an ECG file mm -hmm. that you actually could easily look at in Excel. Again, I've, I've written a couple of blog posts on how to do that. And you could detect a cardiac arrhythmia that way. So, you know, mm -hmm. for instance, one of your clients uh, calls you up and say, you know, I'm, I'm getting like five or 10% artifact here. Can you, can you just define Bluetooth. for us what, can you, can you just define what an artifact is for those who are not familiar with the jargon? Yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the, the uh, software um, looks to see what the beat pattern is and it expects another beat every so often. All right. And there are kind of preset limits mm -hmm. to that expectation. And if there's a beat missing, it, that's an artifact. Or if a beat comes too early, that's an artifact. It doesn't tell you why, what it is. It could have been noise. It could have been, you know, you coughed mm -hmm. or you, 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 you know, you touched the thing and it, it, you know, the electricity has jumped up. Um, uh, it could have been uh, a, a cardiac arrhythmia, an atrial or a ventricular premature complex or something more serious. Mm -hmm. And and again, we can't tell by just looking at the RR intervals. Mm -hmm. We see there's a problem. We see that the software detected something that either came too early or came too late. But one of the nice things with with FatMax in particular, and I use I look at this every day. With my, again, you know, I'm getting older. I got to keep an eye on this stuff uh, to make sure I'm not uh, getting too many atrial arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. um, this is another thing I wrote about recently because I didn't realize how common it was. Endurance athletes uh, commonly get atrial fibrillation. Uh, older endurance athletes in particular, not the guys who are 25, 35, but the ones who have been doing it for 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, we're diverging a little bit, but it's felt to be from remodeling of the heart. Mm -hmm. So the heart remodels you get a little bit of fibrosis and it's adaptive remodeling. It's remodeling that in a way is good. You're, pump, you're able to pump more blood, but this remodeling also affects the heart cells, the pacemaker cells, and you can get some abnormalities of pacemaker function. And that's something that you can find and see before it becomes an issue if you catch it early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, so going back to our, the, the, the heart of the, the matter, I guess, without uh, playing on words too much, heart rate sensors. You talked about the H10, which I guess is a, is a great uh, commercially available tool for, for anybody to get that will give you very uh, accurate readings. I've been using, I've been using the, the H7 myself, but that's just what I had on hand. And um, thanks to you and Marco as well, uh, running that through the HRV Logger app on iOS. And then um, more recently, uh, I, I was able to uh, then link the RR file into Runalyzer or Runalyze and, and spit out a, a nice uh, DFA alpha one graph, which, which is very helpful. But like you said, it's, that's after the fact, where, whereas FatMaxer, and I hope soon if Marco, you're listening, Marco, listen, and Marco, you should add <laughs> rolling two minute windows to your HRV uh, logger. That would be extremely helpful. Um, now, I guess going a little farther again into DFA Alpha One, 
So you talked about variation that you might see when you do your warm up. So for you, who's, uh, you know, has a, has a knack for data and is always uh, looking at that stuff, what variation might you see from one day to the next when you're warming up? If, if you're looking at your DFA alpha one index to try to assess how uh, ready you are to maybe send it or not on, on a bike session, what have you seen uh, for yourself in terms of variations uh, in your warm up on DFA alpha one? Well, for instance, I just did this this morning. I, I you know got on the bike and did my warm up and actually took it up a little bit, almost to the, the first threshold, all right. right, almost, and made sure my alpha one didn't suppress. Mm. Um, and it looked pretty good. I felt fine. And I did some high intensity work. Contrasting a couple of weeks ago, I got some sort of bug, wasn't COVID, was some sort of bug. And um, I noticed that even at very low power in, in the warm up, my alpha one was already like 0. 0.7, 0. 0.6, mm. even 0. 0.5. And even though it was my day to do high intensity, and I, I felt pretty good, I didn't do it because of that suppression. Mm. Uh, the other interesting thing, a couple of days later, I guess I still wasn't back to normal. I, st I felt good. And it still was suppressed, but you know, you were brought up earlier, the different metrics like lactate um, and let's say muscle oxygen. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm, I'm going to do, I didn't make a post on this yet, but I wanted to do, I wanted to see if my um, anaerobic threshold, which I use my oxygen sensor for was, was stable, even mm -hmm. though my alpha one was very bad that day, prematurely bad. Mm -hmm. um, behavior was abnormal. I was curious. I felt fine. And sure enough, I did a, a five minutes at, at my anaerobic threshold and my O2 was st stable. So that's what we look for with, with a moxie. All right. You, you would look for a, a, on the rectus femoris, you would look for a stable O2 pattern mm -hmm. and it was fine. I mean, my threshold looked the same but my alpha one was, was, you know, in the toilet there, uh, meaning that autonomically something was going on, stress, lack of sleep, vi post viral, whatever you want to do, whatever, however you want to call it. And I really, you know, should look at that and pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Like you said, to have a way to see how your nervous system, your autonomic nervous system is reacting to whatever you're throwing at it on the moment during exercises is really interesting. I had a couple questions from a, a colleague of mine, Matt. Uh, thanks for uh, sending those questions to me. And uh, he's, he's been really interested in your work as well on the DFA Alpha 1 side of things. He was asking about, you know, cardiac drift alongside with DFA Alpha 1 drift on longer sessions. Is that something you've been able to assess? Like you talked about the ultra marathoners who saw a depressed DFA Alpha 1 after six hours of trail running. Have you experienced it yourself with maybe even just a two or three hour ride uh, where you might see some, some differences in DFA Alpha 1 at the start and at the end at equivalent output values? Absolutely. The, 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 the thing about cardiac drift, um, heart rate elevation, with, with progressive uh, time spent, mm -hmm. some of that may be autonomic. Mm -hmm. In fact, a lot of it may be autonomic. If you're well hydrated, all right, and it's not that hot out, um, why is your heart rate getting higher? And a lot of that is, is the underlying uh, autonomic nervous system stress response. Is that, sorry to, to, to jump in uh, before you can continue, is that why better conditioned athletes have we, or could that be the reason why better conditioned athletes and fitter, maybe let's talk cyclists to, to take some a simple example, have less cardiac drift, the fitter that they get? Is that because maybe from a nervous standpoint, they're able to tolerate the load, the volume, the duration much better? Exactly. They mm -hmm. have better durability. Yes. Um, you know, a, a hacker like me, an old guy like me, I have like, <laughs> you know, crappy durability and, and yeah. Um, but, but remember, the, one of the reasons the heart rate's going up there is autonomic. Mm -hmm. Now, with, with heart rate, we, we, we don't have absolute numbers. So, you know, if, my, if I go up a little high, what does that really mean? I mean, it's hard for me to know. But if I alpha one has a kind of a self-calibration factor for everybody. Mm -hmm. So if I see my alpha one is 
0.5, which is that uncorrelated, you know, kind of bad pattern, you know, meaning I'm under high stress at relatively low power outputs. Uh, it, it means that, again, I'm um, uh, at a very stressed condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, heart rate will, will also elevate it to some point there, but it could be variable. What we saw with the ultra marathon, they did not see higher heart rate after the six hour run. Okay. But these guys were in shape. Yeah. Yet they had really suppressed alpha one. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Do, would you do you think that DF alpha one might be one of the one interesting metric to keep track of uh, over time for for someone to assess their um, I guess their base fitness? Would you uh, without necessarily doing uh, a ramp if we maybe already have the the value that equals to 0.75 on that dfl for one scale and we have a corresponding output value and or heart rate value is that something that we want to track over time and, and look at you know two two months three months six months 12 months down the line do we do the same output and then expect to see uh, a, a, maybe a, a higher dfl for one in the case that we that we got fitter uh, requiring us to go to a higher wattage in order to find that same 0.75 threshold again. Excellent. Yes. The, uh, as part of that cardiac study we did, uh, the heart failure patients and the cardiac disease patients, they actually went through cardiac rehab mm. and they had uh, RAM tests before and after. And the uh, correlation, the association with improvement in their VT1 all right, their first ventilatory threshold mm. all was very strong with their improvement in their alpha one mm. um, threshold. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not a great association with their improvement in VO2 max, mm. uh, nor was it uh, a great association with, let's say, heart rate max or something like that. Mm -hmm. It specifically correlated very well with their first ventilatory threshold, which is what we would expect if mm -hmm. that's what it's associated with. So yeah, as you get fitter, uh, all things being equal, you know, you're not sick and you're not over overtrained or overreached. Um, yeah, if you see a better power at a, a alpha one of 0.75, your, your first threshold improved. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean your VO2 max improved, it means your first threshold improved. Yeah, the, the different things, hence why when we do a RAM test or uh, or we do some physiological testing, we want those different metrics as part of the results, not just not just the VO2 max, uh, especially not off of the Garmin watch, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, to, to finish off here, Bruce, it's been a real pleasure uh, chatting in depth with you today about all those topics. Just to finish off, what would you say are maybe some of the pitfalls of using the DFL alpha one, or what do we need to be conscious of and look out for as we start applying that uh, approach to our training or to our testing? Biggest pitfall is if you have a lot of artifacts. Hmm. Uh, again, if you have a heart rate strap that's loose, um, that you're using ANT plus and not Bluetooth, you get a lot of dropouts with ANT plus. The bandwidth is not as good. We'll okay. get into that because we don't mm -hmm. have time, but you should always use Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, if you if you are very uh, doing a lot of motion, like a lot of fast running or even, you know, crazy mountain biking, you may just see a lot of noise. And if you see more than four or five percent artifact, those those readings, those alpha one readings are suspect. OK, so that that is a limitation of of the of the uh, technique. Do, do you think that might get better as uh, the technology gets better, as the heart rate sensors get better, the belts get better, or is movement artifacts always something that we're going to have to to deal with? I think we're going to always have to deal with it to some extent. Mm. Um, the 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 interesting part is how do you correct the artifact? Mm. So if you're missing a beat, the easiest way to correct it is kind of just put an artificial beat right in the middle. Yeah. Okay, that's called like linear interpolation. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be ways, and we, we don't have a way of doing this yet, but there may be ways to look at the fractal correlation pattern mm -hmm. that happened before and use that pattern to put in the missing beat. Mm -hmm. So if we do that, we may be able to preserve that, that fractal uh, correlation pattern better. Uh, but those algorithms are not yet available. Okay, so we'll, we'll have to stay tuned for that.
we're stuck right there with what we're <laughs> the older way. Yeah, we just have to do with it. Um, I, I'm gonna have to get you back on because we didn't have even time to talk about the Moxie, which is a tool that you've used extensively and uh, have a lot of interesting, uh, a, a lot of interesting things to to say about. Uh, so it, it would be a pleasure for me to to have you back on. But in the meantime, Bruce, where can people find out more about you and what you do? Uh, my blog is, 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 you know, where I've kind of posted a lot of stuff, both on muscle O2 and heart rate variability and some crazy nerdy stuff on uh, exercise physiology. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on Twitter, BJRMD. Um, I, I check it a few times a week. And again, if uh, my emails on all the articles I've written. Um, so yeah, people can drop me a line if they have a question. Yeah, I, and again, I want to I want to point that out and thank you for it. You've been very very open in our conversations from the the get go. I've sent you some questions, I've sent you some data, and you've always been very helpful and very responsive. So I really really appreciate that. You're quite welcome. Yeah. Okay. So uh, everybody who's watching or listening, make sure you go follow Bruce on Twitter, like you said, BJRMD on Twitter, uh, Muscle Oxygen Training dot com for his extensive blog i want to thank everybody for listening or watching this episode you can find the full video recording on the upside strength youtube channel along with hundreds of hours of free videos about coaching strength conditioning sports science and more and lastly if you enjoyed the show please take a few moments to help and support the podcast by leaving a review on the apple podcast app leave us a five star it's really helpful thanks again for tuning in i'll see you on the next episode see you doc Take care. Bye-bye.